Would you say a word again to the choir for singing? Did great. Thank you, choir. You got that step down really good, right? <laughs> Years of practice. This is what it means to be salt and light in the world, right? To sing well, to love well, to be engaged in that relationship with God. That's in part kind of why we wanted to do this worship series, uh, Salt and Light, to remind ourselves that um, we are of the earth, we are from God, we are for God in terms of how we uh, share God in the world, salt of the earth and light of the world. If you haven't already pulled out your worship notes, I certainly want to encourage you to do so. If you want to use the app, it's now working on both Apple and Android devices, and so I want to encourage you in that. Uh, It's a great and simple tool to uh, take the notes. You just have to tap on fill in the blank. You don't have to write anything down. How cool is that? I'm just going to ask for a testimony. How many of us have downloaded the app already? Anybody? Anybody? Way to go. Good job. Good job. Uh, Great opportunities to sign up for things, uh, to register for things, to uh, help yourself grow in your relationship with scriptures and other kinds of opportunities there on the app. And so I'm uh, so very thankful that you're uh, willing to do that. So as we're salt of the earth and light of the world, we want to remind ourselves, if you either weren't here last week or uh, you just kind of forgot, let's just briefly remind ourselves, what does it mean to be salt of the earth? To be salt of the earth is to help people discover and encounter life in Christ. And you may recall that that help was an acronym uh, that helped us to better recognize what that salt was for. Uh, It's for healing. It's for enhancing God's world. It's for offering life in the world and preserving the richness of God's love in the world. That's what it means to be helpful, to help folks encounter life in Christ, salt of the earth. To be the light of the world still has a great and rich connection with that as well. And as I think through what this light of the world is and what it means to us, I'm reminded of an old story some of you may uh, have heard before, but it helped me years ago to claim the wonder of this light that we are to have. It, it, you may recall uh, the man's name was Alex Papaderos. And Alex Papaderos grew up on the Isle of Crete near Italy in the Mediterranean. And growing up on the Isle of Crete, Papaderos uh, was living as a child during World War II. And during World War II, Crete got occupied by the Nazis. And as they occupied that island, Papaderos and many of his family members were interned uh, in a concentration camp. And while he was interned there in the concentration camp, uh, Papaderos discovered and determined for himself that he was going to be, if he ever got out, a man of peace and reconciliation. That he was going to be a man as he grew up that promoted and provided for the opportunity for people to know peace rather than harm and war. And so sure enough, as a young adult, he got let go, of course, after uh, uh, the Allied forces uh, won the war. He got loose from the intern and, uh, internment, and he went on to college. He became a doctor, uh, that is to say, with a Ph.D. And he began an institution in his early 20s that was for the promotion of peace and for reconciliation. And he would often lecture there, he would clearly teach there, and as is often the case when uh, college students want to interface with their professors, at the end of one of his lectures, one of his students raised his hand, and and when Papaderos recognized him, he said, yes, uh, what's your question? And the question was, Dr. Papaderos, what is the meaning of life? You know, one of those questions every college kid wants to ask, right, and kind of wants an answer to it. No college professor wants to answer. But Dr. Papaderos answered him. And here's what he said. He said, you know, when I was a young boy, before I got interned in the concentration camp, I came across a a motorcycle accident where there were several German motorcycles that had crashed, and, and I discovered there were mirrors all over the ground, broken mirrors all over the ground from the accident. He said, as a young child, I was fascinated by the opportunity to try to put those pieces back together and make a puzzle whole uh, out of those pieces. But he said, uh, there was no way. It was too broken. It was too shattered. It was too fragmented. But I did find a large piece of mirror. 
And I picked up that piece of mirror and I went to a rock and I began to mold in it and shape it and, and scrape it so that its edges were smooth and round. And as a child, I began to use that to shine light in the crevices and in the dark places uh, in the holes because that's what a kid does, right? A kid tries to find uh, where they can shine this light in some dark places. And as a child, it was a toy, Dr. Papadero said. But I began to grow into adulthood. And as I grew into adulthood, I began to put that mirror in my pocket. And I no longer was trying to find the ways I could use it as a toy. But as an adult, it became a symbol to me. It became a metaphor. That metaphor was I was to take my life in fragments, though it may be, shapeless and void of all purpose, I was to take my life and shine it into the dark places of the world, to shine it on dark hearts that sometimes were a part of the world. And I, even though I was a fragment of a man, every once in a while I could help change someone or help bring life to someone else. And every once in a while, Dr. Papadero said, someone else might shine that light as well. Well, you can well imagine that when he said that, there was a calm over the classroom, right? And after the calm had hushed just for a minute, Dr. Papadero said, that's the purpose of my life. What's the purpose of yours? I wonder if that's not the question for us today as we try to delve into what does it mean to be the light of the world? What is our purpose as followers of Jesus, as those who claim faith in Christ, as those who want to be followers of Jesus? What is our purpose? Why are we here? What are we to do with that? Well, I wonder if in part that's not what Jesus was talking about when he gave this great bit of wisdom that we shared in part last week from Matthew 5, the salt of the earth, right? Uh, To be healers, to be enhancers, to be uh, preservers. And also today from Matthew chapter 5, in verse 14. So if you've got your Bibles with you, whether on your phone or in your book or on the app, I want to encourage you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, where after Jesus has described what it means to be the salt of the earth, this is what he says about the light. Here's another way to put it, Jesus says. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Friends, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now that I've put you on a hill, on a stand, shine. Isn't that great? We're called to shine. We're called to let forth with this light of God that's found in Jesus Christ. And in part, it's to reflect who God is and how God is. And so just like last week, we had an acronym for help, healing and enhancement and life and preservation. I have an acronym for us this week because I'm a simple guy and I need simple stuff. And my hope is that it will help us all together to discover what does it mean uh, to shine. So let's kind of walk through the letters. They're in your uh, worship notes there. The S, in order for us to shine, I believe, means that we need to be sincere in our faith. Here's what I mean by that. You know, have you ever encountered those Christians who are really good at showing up on Sunday morning, perhaps even pretty good at quoting Scripture and knowing what the Bible says, but if you were to encounter them Monday through Saturday in their workplace or in their home place or in their community, they're a sorry son of a gun, right? You ever witness those kind of folk? They're not sincere, right? They know the name. They know the claim. 
but they don't understand how to live into it, right? There's a sincerity about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And all that means is that I am real about the way I claim this. I believe Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I believe He's the Son of God. I believe He saved me from my sins. And guess what? I still need that salvation every single day. I need help. I don't have all the answers. I don't have it all figured out. I don't know it all, but I know the one who does. And I want help from Him, and I want to offer that to others. Let's be sincere. You know, there's a reality of the fact that a, a, a church, a modern-day church, is nothing more than a hospital for sinners. Thank you, Jesus, right? There's none of us who are perfect. And a part of sincerity and faith is to acknowledge that. Be real about the way in which you love God in Jesus, and also be real about the fact that every once in a while life kind of stinks. Be real about the fact that you need help, that we all need help, but we know the one who can bring that help, right? sincerity. It's real important and it's even more important to young people because young people can smell inauthenticity a mile away. All we got to do is show up and be inauthentic and it will be seen and heard and known. So let's just be real. A part of this uh, Paul talks about the apostle when he writes to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 12, he talks about how we ought to love one another and be genuine with our affection and take delight in honoring each other. Now, there's reality to that, right? Let's be real and loving. Let's be kind and generous. Let's be merciful in the way that we live. And let's also recognize that every once in a while we struggle in life because life kind of throws stuff at us, right? Life kind of pushes and pulls on us all the time. It's why I'm convinced James would write in his letter in James chapter 1 when he talked about, you know, the, the real Christian, the real follower of Jesus is the one who takes care of the widows and the orphans, but they're also the ones who don't get corrupted by the world. And all he really meant by that is don't let that pushing and pulling, don't let that tugging and, and shoving get you down, but rather recognize the wonderful ways that God lifts us up and helps put us on a hill. And that hill is for nothing more than the capacity to reflect light. Doesn't make us any better. It just gives us the capacity to reflect that light. So the first way to shine, to let people know that this thing called the love of God found in Jesus is real, is to be real about it and with it. Uh, the second thing uh, that helps us to shine the H is, is to be happy. Now, I, I want to say just a little bit more because re really this is joy, but the, the, word, the letter J doesn't fit there, does it? <laughs> so this is to be happy, right? So um, all we really mean by happy is we've we got something to be joyful about, right? God has given us an amazing gift in Jesus. It's no wonder that in the, in the birth narrative that we find in Luke chapter 2, that when the uh, shepherds are out in the field watching their flock by night, remember the angels come to them and they say, hey, I bring you good news of great joy. Not just for you, not just for a certain group of people, but for all the people. And this is joyous. This is a gift. You ever, um, you ever witnessed a sourpuss Christian? They're against everything. They hate everything that's not them. They hate everything that's not about them. They hate everyone that's not just like them. They are no fun to be around. That doesn't shine well at all. In fact, it actually kind of dims the light of God, doesn't it? If ever we've been around or, uh, God forbid, we've been one of them, it doesn't bode well for the light of Christ. It doesn't carry well for the light of Christ. We've got something to shout for joy over. We've got something to really be glad about. Now, does that mean we've got to be happy all the time? Does it mean that life always goes the way we wanted? <coughs> does it mean that everything's working just as we'd hoped? No. But it does mean that if we have joy, we can know that there's hope beyond that moment, hope beyond that set of circumstances, hope beyond this day. It's why Jesus would say, as the gospel writer of John proclaims it for us in John chapter 15, 
When Jesus says to the disciples, I say these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made complete. You see, to shine the light of God says, I have an opportunity to be joyous even when stuff is falling down all around me. Now, in order to shine, not only ought we to be sincere and to uh, be happy, but we also, and, and this is the crux of the matter, right, to illuminate what it is God has for us and, in reality, for the world. One of the beautiful things about light that I love is that virtually every form of light, not every, but almost every, almost every form of light is about shining and illuminating something else. It's not about the light itself. It's not about that, that light, right? It's not about those lights. It's not about the light that's coming through uh, the beautiful windows, right? The light points us to the beautiful images so that we can see God's image in our hearts and in our lives. So to illuminate something is not to point to self to, the, to be the light, but rather to reflect or to shine off of the light, Right? That's what Matthew means when, when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, that we are to, um, in the same way, let our light shine and let our good deeds shine. Why? So that everyone will praise our Heavenly Father. It's not so that they can see anything in us. It's so that we can point them to the light that gives glory and honor and praise to God. That's what illumination is for. It's why Paul would write uh, to the church at Philippi when he said to them, look, we've, we've got all kinds of ways of being. Uh, we can leave clean, leave cl live clean, innocent lives as children of God, but we've got to be able to shine brightly with the love of God. Because if we don't, then we're not really shining, right? We're really just trying to make it look like it's us and it's our doing when it's not. But if we illuminate we allow that light of Christ to shine through us onto other people so that they can begin to discover the richness of God's mercy and the richness of God's grace. Now, the N um, of shine, I think, is very important because in many ways I refer to it as the, the energy drink of this analogy. It's to nurture. And, and what I mean by nurture is that in order for us to shine the light of Christ on others, we've got to nurture a relationship with God. We've got to nurture how we understand who God is in our lives and how God is in our lives, and we nurture that through a relationship with God, right? Prayer, fasting, scripture reading, worship, silence, meditation, all of those things help nurture a relationship with God. And as we nurture that relationship, we know God better, we know God's desire more, we have a better way of understanding how then to reflect that onto other people. It's why Jesus would say, as the gospel writers record it, Mark's gospel records it in Mark chapter 12, that we're to love the Lord God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, right? And our neighbor as ourselves. There are no more important commands than this. Love God with everything. Love our neighbor as ourselves. Because as we love God in our relationship with God, it helps us to better know how to love our neighbor. And as we love our neighbor, we develop and nurture more and more of a relationship and we shine the light of Christ upon others. Now, I love the E in shine. It's my favorite. The E stands for eager. Let's be eager with this love, with this light, for this cause. Have you ever noticed how when you um, uh, let a kid have... Uh, ice cream or candy, that they are eager to receive that, right? You ever notice how uh, when you come home and your dog happens to be there, how eager your dog is to celebrate you? Now, now cats don't do that, right? I mean, I hate cats. <laughs> right, because when you, I'm sorry, did I just say that? <laughs> you know, when, when a cat, when you come home, a cat goes, oh, you're back? When you offer a dog a treat, what do they do? Yeah. What does a cat do? Really? Really? <laughs> but I love the eagerness, right? I mean, the eagerness is absolutely fascinating. The eagerness, is, is, it's, you, you, it's contagious, isn't it? And here's the reality about contagion. 
to be negative and dark, vitriolic and nasty, unfortunately, is contagious. But to be joyous and elated and eager is also contagious. And it offers the opportunity for us to shine the light of Jesus on others in such a real way that they begin to want that, to participate in that. And I love the way Paul the Apostle describes this. It, it, Paul uh, is a great analogy writer, and often when he writes his letters, you know, he'll use one group of people as an example to another group of people. So when he writes to the Corinthian church, he uses the Macedonian Christians as an example. He says to the Corinthians, hey, you, you really ought to get to know these guys. Because, man, they were begging us for the privilege to help the mother church, the saints back in Jerusalem. I really hope, Paul would say, and certainly he intimated, I really hope that you could be this eager. I really hope that you might beg for the privilege as well. Because when all is said and done, the opportunity that we have in order to shine the light of Christ on other people is to have this eagerness about us, this, this yearning and desire to help others see it, right? But far too often, we have been more than willing to let darkness prevail, to let shadows hover, to let evil do its thing. And we've been timid and not quite willing to eagerly step up and shine that light where it ought to be shined. Friends, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Dr. Papaderos really said it well, and clearly Jesus said it best. That when we encounter these dark places or these dark hearts, that our lives are to be about shining that light into that darkness so that we can help people discover life in Jesus, so that we can shine and reflect that light on them. Because ultimately what Jesus meant in all of this, in Matthew chapter 5, when the Beatitudes are blessed are the meek and blessed are the poor, he's saying blessed are those who do these for others' sake. And when he says you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world, it's all about how you reflect and give off what it is God has already given to us. Because it's not about us. It's not about what I know. It's not about who I am. It's not about how I am as a follower of Jesus. But like all good light and like all good salt, it is about enhancing what is already there and shedding the light of God on what is already there. And when we do that, healing and wholeness mercy and justice and God's grace prevails, you see. But it will only happen if we're willing to get a little salty and to be willing to shine just a little bit of what's coming off of God onto us. I pray for myself and I pray for all of us that in the days and the weeks and the months that lie ahead, we will discover more and more how to be salt and light in the world. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you that you shined your light upon your creation in Jesus, that you offered us the light of life from the very beginning of creation, and that you call us, God, to be salt and light in the earth. Help us, God, this day and the next to help people find life and to shine your light on others. In Jesus' name, the great light of the world, we pray. Amen.